So this morning I'm going to discuss the difference between the judgment of men versus the mercies of Jehovah. I'm going to go ahead and start with um, Hosea 11. Hosea 11. There's a statement written here. Verse 9, it says, I will not, or, it's, okay, to, to accomplish the fierceness of my anger, return to destroy Ephraim, Elohim, man, the Holy One, the Kodesh, in the midst of you, to come into the city. Now, why did King James Version write this way? I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am Elohim and not a man, the Kodesh in the midst of you, and will not enter into the city. Because it's written right here. They shall walk after Jehovah. They will roar like a lion, and when he roars, then the children shall tremble from the west. And they shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt, and as a dove out of the land of Assyria. And I will place them in their back in their house, says Jehovah. And it says, even though Ephraim compasses me with lies in the house of Israel with deceit. All right. Man cannot comprehend that. So, let's dig into this scripture a little bit deeper. It says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. And as they called them, so they went from them, they sacrificed to Balaam. And burn incense to graven images. I taught a frame also to go, taking them up by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with the cords of a man with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I gave meat to them, I gave food to them. They returned to the land of Egypt, and Assyria. The king refused to return. The sword abode on his cities, and they consumed the branches, and devoured them because of their own counsels. My people, they hung to backsliding from me. Though they proclaimed the Most High, but none at all would exalt him. It is written right here, the answer is right here in verse 8. How shall I give you up a frame? How shall I deliver you up Israel? How shall I make you as Adma? How shall I make you as a boy in my heart? is overturned. Let's look at that word. Changed. <coughs> My heart has changed. to compassion. My heart has changed to compassion. To grow warm and tender yearning to be united with who? With all Israel. Alright. So, this whole chapter, the answer in this whole chapter is in verse 8. 
even though Israel is bent on backsliding, even though Israel has done all these things and refuses to change, he's changed his mind. I know, I know. People will say, wait a minute now, it says I change not, right? Watch this. You see, as I pointed out in previous uh, uh, videos, that the gifts and callings of Jehovah cannot be changed. The gifts and the calling of Jehovah was that Israel would be the elect. The gifts and callings were predestinated for Israel. Israel was the people whom he foreknew because of sin. Jehovah turned his back on Israel, but that was the change. That was the change. But ultimately, he could not forever change from the original statement. Jehovah, the Elohim of Israel. Case in point, watch this here. Malachi 3 verse 6 Jehovah says or he or Jehovah changes not he changes not, therefore you, sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Now, let's look at this. He do it again. Oh, he he's going to do what again? Now, let's look at this real carefully here. To repeat, to do again, to do it a second time. What do you mean to do this? Why does it say he changes not? What's he going to do a second time? Huh? Whoa, you didn't hear that from your preacher before, did you? What's he going to do a second time? And the sons of Jacob, it says right here to uh, uh, complete an end, finished, accomplished, or spent. Now, it doesn't say annihilation, does it? To complete, to accomplish, what well, right, it says right here, annihilate. Now, so here, It says, even from the days of your fathers, you've gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, says Jehovah of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we re return? Now, so the writings in here are somewhat complicated. But wait a minute, let's go back again to Hosea 11. So he made a judgment against Ephraim here and in the previous scripture, Malachi, to deliver up Israel, to make them as Adma a city near Sodom and Gomorrah, to make them as Zoboam. He made a judgment. That's what he did. But his heart, he changed his mind. 
to compassion and comfort, to grow warm and tender, and to be united with the frame. And this is the reason why, and correctly so, um, they transliterated, not translated it here, where it says, "I will not execute the fierceness of my anger to destroy Jerusalem, to destroy Ephraim." They will walk after Jehovah again, just like it says in Deuteronomy 30. When will they do it? When he roars like a lion. When he roars, the children of Ephraim and all the rest of them will tremble. From, says the West, and that's correct, but it means from the Mediterranean Sea. They're all living on the coastlands, not all of them, but a good chunk of them live on the coastlands of the Mediterranean Sea. Those are the places where they were scattered and then beyond, way beyond. And of course it means, you know, obviously west, westward by implication. Mediterranean, you see? The Yam is the Mediterranean Sea. So, if they're going to walk after Jehovah or come away and depart from all these lands, where are they going to depart from? Well, the West, Egypt, and Assyria. He's going to place them back into their own houses. All right. Even while a frame encompasses with lies, but you see, as I have pointed out in many videos, in Ezekiel 39, verse 12, um, Ezekiel 39, in, in the latter half, he points out that when he saves them from their enemies, that they are going to believe. And then he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit upon them. He's going to pour out his... Uh, Raush Kodesh upon them. He's going to remove the blindness from their eyes. Now, is it because they are righteous is he going to have mercy upon them? No. You see, that is the problem with the way men think. And when King James Version um, interpreted it this way for I am Jehovah or I'm Elohim and not a man that is correct the Kodesh will come so he doesn't think like a man and man unfortunately does not think like Jehovah so what I'm asking you today is to do this All of these notions, preconceived notions that you have in your mind concerning salvation, you need to get rid of. Because I'm telling you, everyone, it seems like these days, whether it be a Jew who believes in Yehoshua or whether it be a Christian, they have this notion inside of them that belief that you must believe first before you can be saved. Who told you that? Where in the scripture does it say that? Show me. And I'll show you 20 of them that says Israel is going to be saved first and then they shall believe. So I want to go to, do I want to go to Isaiah 59 or, yeah, I'm going to go to uh, Romans 9 first. A 
Okay, so even King James Version here points out Jehovah's sovereign choice and backs it up in Genesis 25, 19 to 28 and Malachi uh, 1, verses 1 through 5. Not as though the word of Jehovah has taken, has faded away. It's not, okay, hold on. See, this is the reason why you must be very careful. Use Strong's Concordance. And I know when I use Strong's Concordance, eyes become heavy, ears become shut when people start listening to this. Well, that's too bad because there's a lot to learn here. Not as though the word of Jehovah has taken no effect or has faded away. For no, for not every Israel, Israelite, are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Every child. But in Yitzhak shall your seed be called. Oh, 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 hold on, folks. A lot of you did not allow, did not allow Paul to finish his sentence. A lot of you did not allow Paul to finish his sentence. Why is that? You went and you said, for they are not only Israel, which are of Israel. Bam, end the sentence. See, Henry, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Because he said neither. Or, or not because they are of the seed of Abraham. All the children, but all the children in Abraham, but in Yitzhak shall your seed be called. Oh, well, just because you are of Abraham doesn't make you an Israelite. But in Yitzhak, your seed shall be called. That is, they are which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of Jehovah. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one, even by our patriarch Yitzhak, for the children being not yet born, neither have done anything good or evil, that the purpose of Jehovah according to the election, what do you mean according to election? might stand not of works not by works but of him that calls and it was said unto her Rebecca the elder shall serve the younger the first shall be last as it is written Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. This passage right here, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. You can look at Israel today. Not everyone who lives in Israel are of Israel. Well, that's obvious. And not everyone who considers himself an Israelite is one. I mean, all you got to do is take a look at these folks uh, who are in the United States who call themselves the black Israelites, and they spend half their time running around uh, slandering the Jews. Well, they're not Israel just because they call themselves Israel. Please, folks, let us not twist scriptures. And 
and even if they are the seed of Abraham, even if they were the seed of Abraham, well, many folks in Saudi Arabia are the seed of Abraham, but it had to be Yitzhak, from Yitzhak, and then it had to be from Yaakov, or Jacob. The qualifiers there. And please, if you still think I'm wrong, let me show you this real quickly. Romans 11, verse 26. And so, every Israelite shall be saved. All right? Well, that completely blows this misinterpretation that had been used by the Gentiles straight out of the water. Now, where I wanted to go was, being that he said, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, even though they did nothing evil, good or evil, in the womb. What shall we say then, thinking as men? Is there unrighteousness with Jehovah? Nope. No, there isn't. Because he said to Moshe, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. He's going to have mercy on whom he's going to have mercy, and none of you or me is going to tell him otherwise. We don't tell him what to do. If he decides he's going to change his mind concerning the judgment upon Israel, as is written in Hosea 11, then he's going to change his mind. He's going to turn back to his original statement. Because he is Jehovah and not a man. He stands by his word, unlike us. In the end, He's going to stand by his word. He says, I will have compassion on who I will have compassion. And we don't have any say in the matter. Except for to ask for that same compassion. And recognize that he's going to show that compassion towards all Israel. So it is not of him that is wills, nor of him that runs, but of Jehovah who shows mercy. For the scripture says concerning Pharaoh, even the same purpose have I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he has mercy upon those who he will have mercy and on those and whom he will harden. You will say unto me, Why then does he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? No, but, O oh man, who are you? Who are you to question Jehovah? Who are you? Shall the thing that was created say to him that created it, why have you made me this way? Doesn't the potter have the power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? For as much Jehovah willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endures with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And that he may, might make known the riches of his glory unto the vessels of mercy. Vessels of mercy? Your preacher didn't talk about that. He, he never uses this. Why? Because the vessels of mercy are for Israel. And he can't tell you that and maintain his own false narrative. The narrative of men.
which beforehand was prepared to glory. Now, I want you to please, please listen to this carefully. Do you mean to tell me that there are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that there are vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand to glory? Who are the vessels of mercy whom he prepared beforehand beforehand to glory? Beforehand, predestined. Are you ready? Look, let me show you something. You can look up both of these words, predestined and foreknew. We'll go to uh, Romans 8, verse 30. I keep forgetting to go to Strong's. Verse 30. We know all these things work together for good to them that love Jehovah, to them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow beforehand, where we got the same language, folks. He also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, all right? So you think that's not about Israel, huh? See that word for new? Actually, it's in Romans 11. I say then, has Jehovah cast away his people? Jehovah forbid, for I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Jehovah did not cast away his people, which he foreknew. We have a problem here, don't we? These are people whom he foreknew, Israel. You see, Paul makes it very clear that the people he foreknew is Israel. And in Romans 9, he says this. Where is it? But not Romans 9. It is Romans 8. Verse 28, for we know all these things work together for good to them that love Jehovah, to them who are the calling called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, to them he justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Which is why Paul, in this whole chapter, and I think it's time for me to read this whole chapter again. No, he did not cast away his people he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says about uh, Eliah or Eliyahu? How he made intercession to Jehovah against the ten, tri the, the ten tribes of Israel, the northern tribes, saying, 
Jehovah, they killed your prophets and dig down your altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. And he said, But what was the answer of Jehovah unto him? I have reserved unto myself seven thousand men who have not bowed a knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according of the Israel at this present time. He talks about present time. Concerning this present time, and people, you need to understand that there are different time frames in this chapter. So this is talking about this present time. There is a remnant according to the election of grace. All right? Verse 7, what then? The entire people of Israel at this particular time has not obtained what it seeks. But the election has still obtained it. What do you mean? The light to the Gentiles and to those who have, who are like the days of Eli, uh, Eliyahu, who are obedient of Israel, the election of faith, and the rest were blinded. Now, please, folks, remember, remember, do not forget about the blinded part. The blinded. Once the rest are blinded, the others may not throw stumbling blocks in front of the blind. You don't throw stumbling blocks in front of people anyway. Okay. The rest were blinded because it is written, Jehovah gave them a spirit of slumber that they should not see and ears that they should not hear today. Then he saw, this is this present time Paul is talking about. And he's quoting David. And David said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. And this is very, very interesting. Because Paul uses this exact scripture concerning the Gentiles in 1 Thessalonians 5. But nobody knows. Nobody makes the connection. If this is concerning Psalm 69, verse 22, where it says, Let their table be made a snare, and let peace and safety be, be the trip line. But Paul didn't write that part here. And then he quoted another passage. Let their eyes be darkened that they do not see. Now, and bend together backward. But Paul quoted the same scripture for Israel in those days as he did for the Gentiles in the last days. When they shall say, Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction shall come upon them like a woman in travail, and they shall not escape. Right. Paul was talking concerning Israel. He's talking about the days that they were living in at the point, at that moment. And it would only be a very few short years left after Paul's death that the destruction would happen to Jerusalem. Their table was made a snare. Jerusalem's table was made a snare. And a trap and a stung blo stumbling block and a recompense. It was. But 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 says, Concerning the day of Jehovah's wrath, and you find that the day of Jehovah's wrath is upon the Gentiles, if you read, bother to read, Daniel 12 verse 1. Concerning the day of Jehovah's wrath, you have no need that I tell you that that day will come as a thief in the night. And while they are saying peace and safety, take a look around you. And what are they saying? Take a look. Open your eyes, please, folks. Never in the history of the world have they said peace and safety so much 
lying to the people of Israel today. Lying. They all are lying. They're all trying to take a bribe and fake peace to Israel. United Arab Emirates, um, Morocco, There's, there's like five now different Arab countries that are standing in line or Muslim countries that are standing in, in, the, in line to take a bribe to make peace with Israel, as they say. As it is written, their lips they bless with, but inwardly they curse. Yes. And now you even have the leader of Turkey saying, what about me? But Paul says, I say then have Israel stumble that they should ball, fall. Jehovah forbid, but through their fall or temporary fall, deliverance, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Why? To provoke Israel to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them, and it came, it happened, be the riches of the world, and my, oh my, and right now we're living in the riches of this world is high, higher than it's ever been. And the diminishing of Israel, the riches of the Gentiles, what about their fullness? How much more their fullness? They're filling up. They're filling up? Yes. Exiting the land of the Gentiles and filling up the land of Israel. Not just to their original borders anymore. Fifteen hundred miles from end to end. 750 miles from the center of Jerusalem to north, south, east, and west. I speak to you Gentiles. I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation some of them which are my flesh and save some of them. What do you mean save some of them? In those days, that day, that time, currently in his day, Because if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, then what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? They're going to receive life from the dead? I'm not arguing with Paul. Why are you? Because if the first fruit, and Yehoshua is the first fruit, very likely born on the day that the first fruits was waved on Shavuot. If the first fruit is holy, is Kodesh, the lump is also holy or Kodesh. And if the root of Jesse be Kodesh, then so are all twelve branches. Now, some of them were broken off. And you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and partaking jointly of with them you partook of the root and the fatness tree of the olive uh, fatness of the olive tree do not boast against the branches because if you do if you boast against them you do not bear the root but the root bears you what he's saying is if you're boasting against the branches you are boasting against the root. If you are boasting against the lump, you are boasting against the first fruit. And what did Gentiles do? They disobeyed the words of Paul. You will say then, the branches are broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off temporarily. And you now stand by faith. Do not be high-minded, but fear. 
because if Jehovah did not spare those natural branches, just like he did not spare those who said they wanted to go back to Egypt, but he spared the next generation instead. And that next generation could go to the promised land, but the generation that said they wanted to go back to Egypt, they could not go to the promised land. You see, this is how he saves all Israel. Does that mean that every generation up until the time of the very end is rejected? No, it does not. Just means that this particular generation here was. Now, it is not me who raises people from the dead. All I'm doing is is reading for you verbatim what is written in the scripture and telling you to stop throwing in your own narrative blocking the truth. Look at the goodness and the severity of Jehovah on them which fell severity in that day in Paul's lifetime but towards you goodness if, that's E-N, that means if, you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also shall be cut off. And they, and I know, I cannot get anybody to agree with me on this except my dad. But you see, I have used many scriptures to prove this point. They also, E-N may, means before. I don't care what you say, it means before. Before they abide not still in unbelief. What happens when you have a double negative? You have to change it to a positive because this cancels out unbelief. The not cancels out unbelief. So it says before they believe. So before they no longer abide in unbelief. Before they no longer abide in unbelief. You get it? Grow some brain cells, folks. Let's raise the IQ up a little bit, shall we? Before, before, they no longer abide in unbelief. If you no longer abide in unbelief, that means you're abiding in belief. Right? Right. They shall be grafted in again. So before they believe, they shall be grafted in again because Jehovah is able to graft them in again. And who are you? Who are you to say no? Who am I to say no? Shall. Shall the axe say to the one who swings it, what are you doing? Huh? Shall the clay say to the potter, what are you making? See, Paul continues here. He says, if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted in contrary to nature, into the good olive tree, well, the branches of the good olive tree have a much better chance than you do. That's what he's saying here. How much more shall these be, of these natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits and blindness as part has happened to Israel, until the time of the Gentiles come to an end. And so, what does that say? All the whole of every kind, each and every part of totality. So you can get that idea out of your head that Dan is not going to be saved. 
you can get the idea out of your hand that 144,000 is the only amount that's going to be saved of Israel. Get that out of your head, too. All Israel shall be saved. Because it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer who shall turn, who will turn unholiness from Jacob. So Jacob is still going to be unholy. Jacob is still going to be unrighteous. So they're not going to be righteous when he comes. He is going to have to turn on righteousness from Jacob. Because Jacob can't do it. If you have to turn on righteousness from Jacob, then that means Jacob is unrighteous. Does it not? Can we compute here? Can we see what's going on here? All Israel shall be saved. All Israel of that last generation. The survivors, the remnant. He's going to call the whole remnant. All of them. All, all, all. A-L-L, -L, every one of them, and bring them back. And the deliverer from Zion, he is going to turn away unholiness from them. How is this difficult to understand? It is difficult to understand if you are that piece of clay that is saying to your maker, what do you think you're doing? You are being haughty. Sit down, be quiet, and learn. It is not the one who is willing, but it is the one who shows mercy, because Jehovah is going to show mercy on whom he will have mercy. And I have nothing to say about it, and neither do you. Except to ask for that same mercy. That's it. But we cannot. You may not question the mercy that he shows on somebody else. You may not. Why is he going to give this mercy? By turning unholiness away from Jacob. Because this is the covenant in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. That's why. That he promised. When I will take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they might be the Romans' enemies for the Romans' sakes, but concerning the election... The predestination, the foreknowing, they are the beloved for the patriarch's sakes. That would be Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Because the gifts and calling of Jehovah cannot be changed. They are without repentance. They cannot be repented of. For you Gentiles in times past, you haven't believed Jehovah, but now, at that point in time, when Paul was alive, they have attained their mercy because of Israel's unbelief. Now, so those who do not um, believe at that day, the Jews and all Israel, because the Romans received mercy, they are also going to receive mercy. And there is the righteousness of Jehovah. If he was willing to give the Romans and the Greeks and all those in those days mercy, when they didn't deserve it, then he's going to give it to Israel in the latter days, in the after part, as it says so often in the scripture. Even though Israel does not deserve it. So who 
are you and who is me to argue with him concerning mercy? I'm not going to do it. You go ahead. If you want to go ahead and argue with him concerning mercy, you do so at your own peril, not me. Oh, no. I'm not participating in that. Because Jehovah has concluded everyone in unbelief so that he might have mercy upon all. Well, if he's going to have mercy upon the Greeks and the Romans in the days of Paul, guess what? He's going to have mercy upon all Israel when the time of the Gentiles comes to an end. And that's just the way it's going to be. throughout this whole chapter of Isaiah 10. He tells Isaiah to warn or he um, he says woe to the tyrants. <clears throat> I don't know if I want to I want to to read this here. Shall the axe boast itself against him that hews therewith? Or shall the saw magnify himself up against that which shakes it? And as if the rod should shake itself up against him that lifts it up? Is that what you're going to do when you question his mercy? How he's going to deliver mercy to Israel? To sinful, blind Israel? Well, apparently this is what the Gentiles have done. Paul warned the Romans not to do this. They didn't listen. So what does Jehovah say? For this reason shall Jehovah of hosts Send among the fat people, leanness. Not his fat. I, that's why I've got to go to Strong's Concordance. There's no way around it. Let's see here. And under his glory he shall kindle a burning, uh, a burning like a burning fire. <clears throat> and the light of Israel shall be for a fire and a kodesh, for a flame. And it shall devour, burn and devour the thorns and briars in one day. And shall consume the glory of forests and the, a fruitful field, both body and soul. And they shall be as when the stand bearer faints. And the rest of the trees of the forest shall be few that a child may write them. And it shall come to pass. The day will come that the remnant, last generation, the survivors of Israel that escaped of the house of Israel, Jacob, shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, shall no more be living in the land of the enemy. In those days it was Assyria. Today, the land of the enemy is every land where an Israelite lives. That would be Egypt, Morocco, um, all the land of South Africa, um, Italy, Spain, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Portugal, the Netherlands, Belgium, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, Persia, Iraq, Great Britain, Canada, United States, Australia, South America, all of those lands today are Assyria now.
because they are living in those lands of the Gentiles. But they will stay or support themselves with Jehovah, the Kodesh of Israel in truth. The remnant, the rest, okay, I'm gonna, I also want to dispel something here about the word remnant. All right, Sha'ar, remainder. Everybody thinks that's small. That's a small number. Let's do this. A great number shall return. Jeremiah 31, the New Covenant chapter, folks. This is my checkmate to all of you who say that it's going to be a small number. No, it won't. No, it will not, folks. It will be a great number. Behold, I will bring them from a north country and gather them from the coastlands. And with them the blind, the lame, the woman with child, and he that tra she that trails that travails with child together, a what? Gadol company. A great assembly shall return there. Let's look up this word, Gadol. Bigger. Exceedingly extremely far more than was before far far more now here's what I want everyone to consider this is the new covenant chapter so even though you read in the prophets where it says and their numbers are going to be few you see James in the book of James he says that mercy rules over judgment does he not so I'm gonna to go to that real quickly here and then come back to Jeremiah 31 real quick here Mercy rejoices against judgment. James 2, verse 13. Now, at the time of the end, judgment will be shown without mercy on the ones who has shown no mercy, because mercy triumphs over judgment. Or in our English today, those of you who are very well versed in English, mercy trumps judgment. Mercy overrules judgment. We read Paul's words where he says that he's going to have mercy upon Israel. He's going to show mercy on whomever he's going to show mercy, and none of us has anything to say about it except for one thing, and that is to ask for that mercy ourselves for ourselves so we go back to where was I where was I Isaiah 10 So we just learned that, oh, it's in Jeremiah 30. That's where it was. Jeremiah 31. 31. All right. So the New Covenant chapter, the chapter where the New Covenant appear, first appears. Actually, it first appears in, um, well, it doesn't say New Covenant in Deuteronomy 30, 
but it mentions this, but the first time a new covenant is mentioned is Jeremiah 31. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coastlands, Mediterranean Sea, and with the blind and the lame and the woman with child her trails together, a great company shall return there. Not a small number. So just erase that small number thing out of your head because Jehovah is going to have mercy. He says he's changed his heart concerning Ephraim and the rest of Israel, for that matter. Mercy trumps judgment. Now, um, there's another scripture that says that. I'm trying. I'm trying to remember what it was. Great. Now I can't remember what it was. There was another scripture that says the same thing. But this is enough because this is the new covenant chapter. The new covenant is written in 31. Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, I will make a new covenant, a kadosh covenant, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers and you know the rest this is going to be a covenant of mercy he says he's going to I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more he has to send the deliverer to gather all of Jacob every one of them and to turn unholiness away from them because that's his covenant. This one. When he's going to take away their sins. Now if there are going to be some among them. Who absolutely refuse. Well they're all going to be gathered in. But the ones who refuse to. Obey. If refuse the new covenant. Refuse to swear or sign the new covenant they're going to be thrown out it's just that simple but he said he's going to pour his holy spirit on all of them so i asked the question do you honestly think that he's going to throw the majority of them out you see i believe the holy spirit the raush kodesh is much more powerful than that i do so, if you want to stand with the Gentiles, the sons of Japheth, who think that Israel is rejected, lost forever, is somehow the children of the devil, and cannot be saved, well, you go right ahead. I'm not standing in your way. You go right ahead and join your friends who have promoted this false narrative for lo these nearly 2,000 years and receive their reward or or you can do like I'm going to do I'm completely rejecting that narrative I utterly reject it from top to bottom and I'm going to put my whole self, I will bet everything on Jehovah's mercy for Israel. 